Hi everyone, uh, I just wanted to introduce to you uh, Excel as an example of a spreadsheet program uh, you can use for plotting data. Uh, I just wanted to show you, uh, some of you uh, are completely new to it and some of you are more uh, experts at it as well, but I just wanted to show you some common functionalities that we can use. Uh, this sort of practice that we do will be super helpful uh, as well uh, in future labs as we come uh, time to do our future IA as well. Uh, if you can sort of lay out your information uh, in this manner, uh, it should be able to help you uh, uh, not only calculate things very quickly, but in case things uh, need to be corrected, you should be able to fairly easy uh, backtrack your steps and figure out what went wrong. So uh, just a quick introduction and tutorial for Excel. We're going to be doing a lab or two using Excel as a spreadsheet program, and uh, this will definitely help out uh, instead of plotting everything by hand and uh, showing every single calculation, you to see how uh, this could be used to our advantage. So uh, just a brief introduction here. So Excel is a spreadsheet program. Um, you do have access to it using your Office 365. On Macs, I think there's this program called Numbers, which does something similar as well. For any uh, spreadsheet program, you're going to see that you have letters going across the top. So we're going to have A through Q, uh, and I have numbers going down here. Basically, with the letter and the number together, it gives each of these cells, each of these squares on our spreadsheet, a particular address. So, for example, the cell that I've selected so far is address letter E and 17. This cell here is called E17. I can scroll over here. It highlights for me here. We're under column J, and we're row number 21. Uh, the spreadsheet here basically goes on for as long as you need it to. So the letters, after going through the alphabet, it goes to AA and then continues onwards in there. Uh, Number-wise, I think it goes down to like 65,000 rows or something. Uh, hopefully, you'll never need to go uh, that far on the spreadsheet. But uh, in case you do need extra rows or whatnot, uh, you can just right-click uh, the uh, column or the row itself, and you can just insert uh, columns or cells as you need. So. For each of these cells here, we talked about it having an address. So right now here, I'm in F17. Right now, this cell here is uh, under the default option. So uh, things that you can put in cells is definitely text. So uh, test, you can type in numbers. Uh, what's really advantageous to this, however, is you can uh, type in formulas into Excel. So basically, for formulas for cells, what it's going to do is it's going to take static text, uh, hopefully your raw data and experiment, and it's going to operate on uh, your data. Uh, I'm giving you a sample of the aluminum foil lab that we did uh, about a month ago, uh, just so that you can see uh, some of the power of the spreadsheet program. Uh, I'm going to show you how I've laid out my spreadsheet. It's not the only way of laying it out, but these are some elements you might want to include uh, when you uh, do plot out a, a spreadsheet and uh, uh, try to do it for your lab. So. Uh, if you remember back in the aluminum foil lab, uh, we took four sheets of aluminum foil. I asked you to take uh, sort of small pieces, ranging to bigger pieces. We pretended that they were rectangular in size, so that way we can measure the area. I've quoted some of the formulas for you. Area is equal to the length times width. Volume is mass divided by density. Because aluminum is a pure substance, it has a constant value. I've just left that density for you up in this uh, corner here as well as eventually for thickness, which is one of the dimensions. Uh, we basically take volume, which is length width height. We divide it by the length width of area, and we end up getting our height, which we're calling our thickness. So what I would do here is if I were doing this experiment, I would save some room here just for your raw data. So in this case here, I've laid out, uh, I've titled everything, make sure you have units and everything like that. Uh, I knew I would have four sheets of foil, and I've just plotted down some random numbers for you just for comparison's sake here. These ones here are just all static numbers. So uh, as you make your measurements, you can record them. Because measurements in science uh, do include errors to them, you'll notice instead of writing it just straight in one cell, 14.7 plus minus 0 0.05, I left one column just for the raw data, just for the measurement itself, and I created a separate column right beside of it. This one here says delta L or delta W. That delta symbol reminds me that it's an uncertainty or it's a plus minus, and I'm actually going to treat that in its own cell. We're going to see the advantage of doing that in a second here because now the error part is in its own cell. When we uh, type in a formula for Excel, we can just refer to the address of this cell without having to worry about the 14.7. But based on our measurements so far, I can read this as it's 14.70 plus minus 0 0.05 and so on and so forth going onwards. Uh, one thing Excel doesn't really do a good job of is actually sig figs. So you'll notice when I typed this number in earlier, I typed it in 14.7, but it's showing me 14.70. What if I really wanted it to be one decimal place? Uh, in the past, uh, your options were had to go to right-clicking the cell. We would have to format the cell here individually. 
Uh, because the cell here is defaulted as just a general, it can accept letters, it can accept numbers, it doesn't really know what you're going to put into this. Because I know it's a number, I can specify it's a particular number as opposed to the default general tab here which would format any which way. So I'm going to put number to it here. If I need to change the decimal places here, I can change it by toggling this back and forth. So in case you need to do significant figures, that's one way of doing it. One other way of doing it here is you can actually force Excel to leave the formatting exactly the way I've typed it. So for example, if I really was set on this being 14.7, what I can do is I can uh, go into this cell here. I can start off with an apostrophe symbol. Apostrophe will basically force Excel whatever that I type later on is basically going to be the formatting that it's going to show. So I type it in as 14.7 and it's going to show exactly 14.7. Uh, it doesn't let it suddenly go 14.70 and so on and so forth. So uh, apostrophe could be an advantage. Uh, in the new uh, Excel, what they've done for you really conveniently, if you go under the Home tab, depending on your version, you're going to find that the platform might be a little bit different. Some of the functionality is a little bit hidden away, but for at least the newer versions, your Office 365 version here, you're going to find this option here, either increase decimal or decrease decimal. So super convenient if you're doing it sort of cell by cell. If for whatever reason I want this one here to be say three decimal places, I can just increase decimal places. If uh, I have a number that's only one decimal place, I can click that. Again, under the Home tab, I can decrease decimals however I like. So uh, hopefully that will prove uh, to be very useful for you. Uh, again, this is just a sample of aluminum foil data. I have our four sheets of foil, uh, the lengths with the errors, widths, as well as the mass. So these ones here are all static numbers. These are all numbers that I punched in based on our measurements. We know later on we are going to use density of aluminum, so I just put that in one static cell. Again, this is a number that I typed in myself, so this is 2.70 plus or minus 0 0.02. Here's just really demonstrating for you the power of Excel. So uh, we're going to do these formulas one by one here. Uh, if you look back at your questions, what you were asked to do was to calculate the area. To find the area of something, we want to multiply length times width. So traditionally, what you would do is you take out your calculator, you type in 14.7 times 12.10, you follow your sig fig rules, and you just quote me the number. In this case here, the power of doing it on Excel is you can actually type it in as a formula. I want the area to be calculated right here. So I'm actually going to tell Excel it's going to start off with a formula. I'm going to use the equal symbol to tell you what's upcoming up next is going to be formula. This time, instead of typing in static text or static numbers, this time I'm going to use those cell addresses, the letter and the number, and basically Excel is going to go to those addresses, go to those cells, and operate on it how I would. So in this case here, I want length times width. Say I want to do it for sheet number one. I'm going to say equal to start off a function. I'm going to say it equals to B2 because that's the length of my first sheet, and I'm going to use my regular operators here. I can use plus, minus, I can use the asterisk for divide, uh, for multiply, and then the slash for divide. In this case here, I just want the asterisk, so I want Excel to take whatever's in B2, currently it's 14.70, because I want to multiply, I'm going to say multiply the width here, which I put in into cell D2, which is 12.10. Excel knows the formula, it's going to go straight to these addresses, it's going to operate on it by multiplying, I press enter, and there we go, it's multiplied for us. Again, you can play around with the sig figs based on that increased decimal, decreased decimal uh, uh, stuff we just talked about. What's really nice about this program here is, I know how to calculate the area, you'll notice that the other sheets of aluminum foil, I put the numbers directly underneath it. What I can do is I can take this formula, Right now, it's finding the cell B2, and right now, it's finding the cell D2 and multiplying. If I just control C, control V, I copy and paste it here. If I copy it and I go one row lower, Excel knows to propagate the formula one row lower. Because I still remain in the same column, the letter doesn't change. I'm still B and D. But because I'm now one row lower, instead of going to the row 2, B2 and D2, it's now suddenly knowing to go to B3, D3. You can double check your formula. That's perfectly what I want. I want B3 right here. I want D3 right here. And I can similarly here, copy and paste it here. I have four sheets of foil, so I can do that four times. And right away, Excel has done four formulas for me. Okay. So hopefully you already see the advantage of that. Uh, I'm going to show you Excel can even propagate errors very nicely here. So if you remember in a formula here where we need to multiply numbers, the types of errors we're going to add is actually relative errors. I need to take the sort of fractional error, how bad the plus or minus is on any particular measurement, and add those together. So I'm going to have the error, uh, the error in area show up right beside it here. I'm going to start off with that equal, because it's not going to be static text or static numbers that I type in. And I'm going to give it uh, the formula that I want. So in this case here, 
I'm doing the error in length and error in width. I'm going to take this time what's in C2. Now you see the advantage of just having the number of error, just the plus or minus by itself, because now I can operate C2 divided by B2. That would be the relative error. That would tell me how bad 0 0.05 is on 14.7. I can add that to the error in width. That's an E2 for me divided by D2. Those are my relative errors. If you remember, that still gives you a, a fraction as a decimal. Remember, this plus or minus here still has to be taken out. If I convert it back to absolute, it still has to be multiplied by the actual area. In this case here, I have it in the address C8. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add brackets. So Excel knows to do that order of operations first. It's going to add the relative errors, and I'm going to multiply it by the area that I get. And there we go. Excel's done it for you. It's done all that horrendous math behind the scenes. Yes, on the lab report, you still need to uh, do one sample calculation. You do need to show me the propagating uh, at least one time. But especially in a lab like this, where you're having to do the same calculations four times, you don't need to show me the work all four times. I can similarly copy and paste it because what's going to happen here is it's going to go, because I'm one row lower, all these numbers are going to go down one row. It's going to go down to row three, which is exactly where I want for the next sheet, row four and row five. I can simply go control C, control V, copy and paste. The other option here is you can go this bottom right corner. You see this little green uh, corner. You can actually drag that column and you can drag it as far down as you want the formula to copy. And there you go. You propagated errors for four different sheets already. Again, you'll need to adjust the sig figs accordingly here. Usually for the sig figs, I'd copy it over to Word or some sort uh, before just formatting the numbers. But hopefully you see the power in that. Let's say your friend comes back to you and says, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say 15.23. I meant to say this was 14.6. You'll notice that when I type in this 14.6, I want you to watch for this number here. This is sheet number two. Because these two are typed in as formulas, when you change the static text, the actual measurements, these ones here automatically update for you. It will have done exactly the same formulas. It'll take the new B3 times the D3, give you this answer, as well as propagate the corrected number through uh, the trial. Later on, when we do graphs with this as well, the graphs will also refer to these particular addresses. If you did something similar and you had to come back and change some numbers, it would automatically change the plotted point for you. So that's sort of the advantage of um, using Excel. Let's just go on here and let's calculate volume. Volume, by definition, is mass divided by density. I have my masses tabled out as static values here. I'm going to start off by telling an equal symbol. Try it out for yourself. What should my formula be? What should my addresses be for me to actually divide the particular mass of the sheet here divided by the density? In this case here, I have my mass in F2. So I'm just going to either click that cell, or you can even type in the address by itself. I can type in F2. I'm going to use the slash symbol to do the divide. And I'm going to divide it by I2, because that's where my density number is actually sitting. Excel knows to take whatever's in here, right now it's 0.8, divided by 2.70, you press the enter, and voila, you have your dense, uh, you have your volume. Similarly for the error here, I'm going to start off with the equal to tell Excel what I'm going to type now is going to be a function. Again, through divide, it's the same rule as propagating errors through a multiply. I need to take relative errors, take the error in the mass, divide it by the error and uh, divide it by the mass itself. I plus the error in density, divided by the density itself. Again, we have purposely separated. Even though the number was 2.70 plus or minus 0 0.02, I put it in two particular cells so that I can click each number uh, by itself. That one there is adding relative errors. I'm going to put the brackets again, as we did earlier, and then we're going to multiply it. That's still a percentage. That's still a fraction. I want to take that, re-multiply the volume to convert it back to absolute, and there we go. We've calculated the error. In a similar fashion, like I mentioned, you can drag this lower uh, green corner downwards. I'm going to do that for this one just to see, show you that it works here. You can double check your formulas. Okay, and in this case here, it's complaining. Okay, If you take a look at your formulas, what's happening here, we have F2 divided by I2, no problem. 0.8 divided by 2.7 is giving you a number. Just like we did before with copy and pasting, control C, control V, the problem here is because I'm now one row lower, Excel has suddenly changed the numbers to one row lower. It's trying to take F3 and divide by what's in I3, but I don't have anything in I3. It's thinking you're trying to divide by a blank. In most cases, blanks are treated to be zero. You know, in math class, you can't divide by zero. So that's why it's giving you an error and saying, I can't do this calculation. Something's wrong. Now, definitely one quick fix of this here is, well, the problem was there was nothing in I3 or later on I4 and I5. I can just copy and paste this number. 
if I actually put the number in for I3, then it won't complain anymore. It's going to divide this by the I3, totally fine. Now, it's a little bit cumbersome having to type that in multiple times. Excel is actually a little bit smarter uh, here. What you can do is you can actually play around with how you actually type in the address in the formula. So, so far for the formula, I've typed in F2 and I2. It knows when I go one row lower, it knows that the number needs to be propagated one bigger. This time, what I want to do is I want to take, yes, the F and the G, which have the mass numbers in them. Yes, this one here, I wanted to propagate numbers lower, but the I, I always wanted to refer to I2. What I can play around with is this sort of formatting here. So far, we've just been using letter and number. As you change up and down, the number will change. As you change left and right, the letters will change. That's how a spreadsheet program will work. What you can play around with is you can actually add these dollar symbols. And you can actually play around with dollar just for the letter or dollar just for the number. In general, though, you'll probably, depending on how you lay out your spreadsheet, you'll majority use it completely free, so no dollar symbols, or having dollars for both. Excel will basically read this dollar and basically say, I want you to use exactly this cell. I don't care where you copy and paste it. Uh, I may be a couple rows down, I may be a couple columns over, but it's always going to refer only to I2. So in this case here, I'm going to modify my formula a little bit. I'm going to say F2. I'm going to add those dollar symbols. I'm going to tell Excel to only always use I2. It doesn't change this number because it's still taking F2 divided by the 2.7. The number is unchanged. But this time, when I copy and paste it, when I drag this column downwards, this time it's not going to complain anymore. Because if you double check the functions here, you see F2 divided by I2. When I go one row lower, the one that didn't have the dollars, the row number here is now lower, but with the dollar symbol, it knew, no, I'm only going to refer to this I2 no matter where I go on the chart here, so it's going to always divide by I2, likewise for these ones here. So that's why it's not trying to divide by zero anymore, uh, it's not giving me that error symbol. I want to show you here, again, what I'm going to need to do, because I2 and J2 have my only density and my only error. In this case here, wherever it refers to J2 and I2, I'm going to add that dollar symbol to force Excel to be like, oh, when I copy it one row lower, I still want it to refer exactly to those cells only. So I'm going to press Enter here. It doesn't change that error. Another quick way of doing cut and paste here, you don't even need to hold this lower green corner and drag it downwards. You can actually just double-click that there, and it already knows how to copy and paste it. Similar, like I mentioned before, if your friend comes back to you and says, oh, I actually meant to say this is 0.63, let's say, it'll automatically update. Because what Excel is doing here is it's just uh, calculating with functions. It's taking whatever is currently in F4. You may have just needed to change that, and it's already operated on the numbers for you. So super powerful. I've just done, uh, you may have still needed to show the sample calculation, but I've showed all the work here for the other three sheets. At the end of the day, you just give me one table of what's called process data. Uh, you can just copy and paste this data. If I did exactly the same math for the other uh, foils, this is what I would have gotten. Just for completeness sake here, you can try typing in the formula for thickness. In this case here, thickness is supposed to be volume divided by area. I'm going to start off with the equal symbol. I'm actually going to use the apostrophe symbol so you can actually see what formula I'm actually typing in. It's not going to calculate for you. I'll show you what happens after I take away the apostrophe. I'm going to type it in equals to. I'm going to take the volume. So take what's in F8 currently. I'm going to divide it by. I wonder if that helps. Oh, it actually doesn't work with the apostrophe. Let's try it without the apostrophe then. Uh, let's take F8. Divide it by the area which is currently sitting in C8. So that has done volume divided by area. We're getting the right order of magnitude for a thickness. Similarly here for the errors here, I take the relative error. How bad is the 0.06 on the 0.2963? Plus it to how bad the area 1.193 divided by 177.87. Uh, because I don't need to, like these ones here will propagate down the rows. I don't need to add any dollar symbols or anything. I do, however, need the bracket to make sure I add the relative errors and I multiply three with the thickness. Uh, did that work there? Oops. So, so you can go back and you can actually change your formulas as you need, multiply it by this thickness, and there you go, you convert it back to absolute. It's already done this E notation. When you're writing it out uh, on a formal lab report, I'd still convert this back to times 10 to the negative 5, but you know from the our class here, EXP is shorthand for scientific notation. We can similarly here just drag these down. I want to do it, and there we go. We have all the errors. We propagate it through. If later on you change any of these numbers, these ones here will populate uh, directly. So 
hopefully you're starting to see some of the advantages of Excel. You're more than welcome to use Excel for any future labs. Really good for uh, plotting data. Uh, even if you're, as you're doing your data, it might be good to actually, uh, you just recorded a new set of numbers, see whether the numbers make sense. You should be able to track whether you've made any errors earlier. Um, that's much better than having conducted all your experiment and then realizing, oh, my numbers are off and now I've wasted all that time. Having Excel plotted in real time for you uh, will save you a lot of time. One thing Excel doesn't do very well is actually copy and paste. Again, as I mentioned, copy and paste is nice because it automatically propagates the formulas for you, really useful when you're operating on numbers. In this case here, let's say I take this section here and I just copy and paste this. Let's just go to some random region on my Excel page and I copy and paste it here. You'll notice it's complaining. Let's just double check the formula, what it's trying to do. Because I am now quite a few more rows downwards and quite a few columns over, if you look at the formula, Instead of the formula being B2 times D2, it's actually going to, relative to this cell here, currently I'm in J22, uh, it's trying to take what's the equivalent, one column before, a little bit high, it's trying to take what's in I16. Well, there's nothing in I16, and there's nothing in J16, which is why it's saying, well, when I multiply zeros, I get zeros. That part there is trying to divide by zero as well. It's not working. So. Again, it's a good thing that when you copy and paste, it automatically knows how to propagate rows. If I'm just trying to format my data, Excel doesn't do a really good job of this. Rather, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna actually do a special paste. Let's say I wanted to do just that here. I wanted to copy and paste exactly these numbers, exactly as they're written, but I don't want it to actually propagate numbers, propagate columns over. What you can do is you can click over to whatever cell that you want. You can start off with the right click Instead of defaulting, just paste it as formulas where it was complaining earlier with zeros and divide by, uh, divide by zero can't do it. We can actually just take the values from these cells, the 177, 179 or so. We can take them out as static numbers and actually tell Excel, now that I'm in this new part of my spreadsheet, just take them as static numbers and actually give me the numbers back. Just paste the values. You can even paste them uh, with the uh, formatting as well. Okay, uh, But in this case, your value would be the easiest. So paste the values, and there we go, their values. How come it works this time? If you click here, you'll notice no longer it's a formula. What it's done is it's taken the static number, 177.87, and it's actually created a cell with that text, 177.87, in there, and that's why this part here will copy and paste to different places, no problem, because these are just static numbers. The disadvantage of doing it this way, you see anything, anytime there's something good, there's always something bad. Because these ones here earlier were formulas, Earlier we had said we changed numbers. Let's say this was like 16.20 or so. You'll notice that the formulas itself will update. Any equations that link to that cell here will automatically update. In this case here, because this is now static text, it doesn't change based on what I changed in my raw data. So be really careful when you are copy and pasting. Sometimes pasting values will be helpful for you. Usually I would just paste it over to Word so that my formatting is better. Uh, I'm gonna give you this spreadsheet here uh, just on our team so you can play around with this here. Practice for yourself typing in static text, ty typing in static formulas, uh, leave the measurement and the plus or minus in separate columns, and then play around with using the dollar symbol so that Excel isn't complaining with uh, uh, having divided by zero. One last thing I wanna show you with Excel here, this will be very useful for a lab that's upcoming. You can actually use Excel here to actually plot numbers for you. So in one of the labs that we're going to do, we're going to actually take some measurements of the length of a gas chamber. So I'm just going to make up some numbers here. I'm actually going to delete this for a second here. Let's say I measure the length of my box to be uh, 2, 4, 5, and 6. It doesn't have to be evenly spaced. Excel is fairly smart in actually plotting the numbers. Again, Excel doesn't do a really good job of sig figs. So if you're having to change decimals, you can do that uh, from that point there. In this case here, I have the length. In our lab, we're gonna see that the, um, the volume, when I go length times width times height, I'm gonna multiply it by a few static numbers. So this will become more clear when I actually do it on the lab. I'm gonna press equal to, volume is proportional in our formula to length times width times height. So different from the aluminum foil lab that we just did. What I'm gonna get you to do is I'm gonna say equals, take whatever's in L2, take this length, multiply it. Our chamber later on on our actual lab is gonna be 5.6. We're gonna imagine the depth of it's one. So you see in formulas, it doesn't have to just be uh, cell address times cell address. You can actually type in static numbers and it'll automatically uh, do the calculation for you. And there we go. Uh, just double click that there and it has given 
then like th that calculation, length times width times height, times those static 5.6 and 1 that will show up on our lab. When I'm interested in plotting a lab data here, what you're going to do, I'm going to first be interested in plotting pressure versus volume. You'll notice I already have all the headings. This time I have actually have the errors again in their own cells, but one column over. The reason being when Excel tries to plot a graph, when you highlight two columns, make sure you put the x, the, depend, the independent variable, the, uh, the one that you're changing here on the column on the left-hand side, the one on the right-hand side will be your dependent variable, which is the responding variable. So here, let's say I wanted to plot pressure against volume. I would highlight the two columns. You want to insert it. Again, depending on your version of Excel, your, uh, your table may not look exactly the same. The temptation will be to use this uh, connecting the dots graph. We will use that in Chapter 3. Majority of cases, we're dealing with continuous data. What we're going to actually want to use is actually a scatter plot. So in this case here, I'm going to use this sort of dot-to-dot -dot graph here. I'm going to choose one just ha that just has the dots uh, individually. Some of these other ones here already have a trend line. I can add the trend line afterwards if I need to. So I'm just going to add the dot-to-dot, -dot, and automatically Excel has plotted the graph for you. So again, it saves you time from having to try to plot by hand. Uh, the disadvantage, are, again, here is it doesn't really give me the ways to change the axis titles. What I would do is when you're clicked on the chart, it actually changes your top tabs. I know you can't quite see that, but it says the design tab or format tab. I would typically choose a quick layout. Uh, I usually choose this first one here. Choose one of these layouts here, one of these formattings that actually allow you to actually type in the titles. Remember for your titles here, you want it to be sort of Y versus X. In this case here is pressure versus volume. So pressure versus volume. Uh, units are a little bit hard to do, so I'm just going to have to do like the hat three like that. And in this case here, because this quick layout, this default, actually gives you the option of actually changing the title, I can just double click here and I can edit. In this case here, I have pressure on my vertical axis and atmosphere. ATM stands for atmosphere. And on this side here, I'm going to change that to volume. Nanometer. Uh, especially if you have multiple series, multiple sets of data, you might get a uh, longer legend there. Usually what I do is I just delete that because that doesn't really show me any detail. Uh, I want to show you with this graph here how you're going to add a trend line. When we plotted our scatter plot, again, order really doesn't matter. Let's say my 33.6 point actually came in earlier. It will still take x coordinate, y coordinate, and put the same point. If you came along and changed any of the numbers, let's say pressure, instead of being 2.4, I wanted to make uh, let's make it 2.7 instead here, so 2.7. You'll notice that Excel will automatically uh, propagate the number up for you. Okay, So again, that's the power of using Excel because it's dealing with everything as functions. It's using every, all the numbers exactly as is uh, and then plotting the data that's currently sitting in those numbers. If you're interested in adding a trend line, you just need to be careful when you're clicking it here. Click on the actual data itself. You're going to right-click here. You can hit Add Trend Line. It'll pull up a window on the far side here. Most of the graphs in high school will come out as straight lines, but in some cases you do get a curve or you get a polynomial function. Just uh, toggle it over to whichever graph you think it's going to be. It's going to automatically update it for you. Uh, let's just say we stick with a linear for now here. Uh, you can set the intercept. If you somehow know, based on your systematic errors, the intercept should be zero. You can do that that way. Uh, sometimes it's advantageous to actually display the equation. So for this fit, you notice for a line, it's mx plus b. The slope of the line is a negative. We have a y-intercept for a plus. One other thing that you might want to toggle on is display something called an r-squared value. The r-squared value is a correlation coefficient. Basically, what that tells you here is it tells you, based on our data with all the random errors, sometimes it's on the high side, sometimes it's on the low side, it's telling us how closely our dots actually fit to this straight line. An r-squared coefficient of 1 means it's a perfect correlation. All my dots are exactly on the line, exactly as I wanted to. In this case here, our r-squared is not too bad. I notice some of them are too high, some of them are too low. I'm sort of jumping up and down from that straight line position, but at least the r-squared value here is pretty close to 1, and that's an indication of how close to a linear fit that I actually am. I want to show you in this case here how do we add error bars. Very common that we need to use it in science here. Uh, when you're clicked onto the chart, again, the newer uh, Excel uh, versions here will have a plus. It will allow you to add a chart element. Uh, you might need to dig through some of the top tasks to actually find this on the older versions. But in this case here, we're going to add a chart element. Right now here, the error bar here hasn't been toggled, so I'm going to just go toggle that on. 
Right now here, it's just giving me default errors. These may not be exactly the ones that I measured. What we're going to do is we're going to click over here, and we're going to click over to more options. I don't want it to just give me some standard error. I don't want it to just give me some fraction or whatever. I want it to actually represent the errors that I actually had calculated in the lab itself. So we're going to click over to more options. In this case here, let's see if I can just drag it over. In this case here, we're going to pull this over so you can see. Uh, what we're going to do is you can toggle either the X error bars first or the Y error bars. Sometimes you don't have X error bars, so you can just delete those ones. In this case here, because my X is volume and I do have X errors, I'm going to click on the X error bars. It pulls up this formatting horizontal error bars option. I can toggle it to just show the left error or Y error, but mainly here I want to have a custom error. I want to actually specify for each data point what the error should be. And I'm actually going to specify the value here. In this case here, I have my errors in a separate cell by itself. I'm just going to click for the positive, for the high side of it. I want you to take these numbers here, press enter. For the negatives, for the left-hand side of it, I also want you to take those same values. And there we go. Once I press OK, it would have typed in the errors for me. If I need to then change the errors, if I suddenly make this error, let's say a plus or minus 5, you'll notice that suddenly updates for there. Exactly the same deal when you do your Y error bars. Click the Y error bars. Make sure you're on the format error bars menu here. We want both errors, but we want it to have a custom. Custom for pressure errors, I have this in uh, cell P2 down to P5. I'm going to specify the values. You could even type in the values, but I find it's easier just to drag over it. So take those values there. That's going to be the error on the high side. And then plus or minus, that's going to be the error on the low side. Hit an OK, and there we go. It scaled the values. And you notice by doing it this way, it's possible that different measurements, maybe some readings were easier, some readings were harder, and some errors are bigger and smaller, and it automatically updated that for you. Okay? So uh, that's sort of plotting a graph here. For this particular graph, we notice that it sort of follows a nice curvy trajectory here. In our gas law section, we saw we can actually linearize the graph. Linearizing actually involves hiding the reciprocal part. Instead of having P versus 1 over V, let's actually calculate what 1 over V is, and then let's uh, track what the graph would look like. So again, for, uh, your formula for Excel here is fairly nice. We're going to put an equal symbol. I'm going to take a reciprocal 1 over, take the number that's sitting as a volume here, M2. I'm going to copy it down for 4, because I have 4 data points. If you just check it here, M3, M4, M5, exactly what I want, because there's no dollar symbols. And then for pressure, I'm just going to recall the number. You don't actually need to type in any plus minus or anything. I can just say equals a cell, take whatever's in this cell, and then just copy it down. And there we go. We've tabulated through the linearized set of data, the sort of linear form of this exact same data. I highlight the columns, horizontal first, then vertical. I insert insert it as a scatter plot, and there we go. We have a slightly more linear graph. It doesn't have those axes labeled, so I click click layout. I click one of these formats here, which allows me to change it, and this time when I do a linear fit, it might look nicer than this curve. Okay? So that there is just a nice introduction of Excel. Play around with a little bit with the file that I give you. Uh, hopefully in time, you'll be more and more comfortable with using Excel. Uh, again, for a formal lab report, you'll need to show me a formal calculation, an actual, like, worked out problem, how did you propagate errors for just one trial. For all the other trials, you can just plug it over into Excel and then just give it to me as one table of process data that includes everything, uh, all the other um, calculations for the other raw data sets. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, hopefully that helps.